All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to this lunchtime talk sponsored by the Nathanson Center. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to welcome Alex Neve. Alex is the Secretary General of Amnesty International's English branch based in Ottawa. This is a position he's held for the past 15 years and has distinguished himself immensely in that role. He is the primary voice and face of Amnesty International in Canada. Alex began his legal career in, uh, pra in practice in Toronto, where he worked at a community legal aid clinic in the, er in the area of immigration and refugee law. He's taught here at Osgood International Human Rights and Refugee Law, and he maintains an affiliation with York's Centre for Refugee Studies. Alex holds a master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Essex and an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of New Brunswick. In 2007, he was named an officer of the Order of Canada. I'm very pleased to welcome Alex Neve. Pleasure to have an opportunity to be here. As, uh, as just been noted, I've, uh, I've had past affiliations with with uh, the York campus, both here at Osgoode and over at the Centre for Refugee Studies, and, uh, and always appreciate being back uh, and seeing uh, familiar faces and current colleagues, so I look forward to this. Obviously, those of you who know the topic of my speech will know I'm not here to talk about cheery and, and rosy matters. Uh, I'm here to explore with you a number of pressing concerns, but the way forward uh, with respect to a very, very crucial human rights issue, and that's the campaign, the effort, the struggle here in Canada and around the world to confront and, of course, ultimately end torture. Uh, and there are so many dimensions to that struggle against torture, but obviously here I am today uh, in a law school, so I'm going to be focusing very much on legal dimensions. Uh, where is there good law? Where is there bad law? Where is law being ignored? Where does law get abused? Where does law need to be reformed and improved and created uh, in this effort to prevent and stop torture? Uh, but of course there are many, many other dimensions to the struggle as well. And I guess the starting point is, uh, is to say, you know, at a certain level, the law on torture couldn't be more straightforward and simple. You state it in one sentence. No one shall be subjected to torture. That's the law on torture. And there's a lot that's packed into that, obviously. No one means no one, no person, no matter who they are. Uh, that sentence also means anywhere, any corner of the world, any corner of this country, any time. And for any reason, all of that is in that one sentence. And there are very, very few human rights, in fact, that are stated in such clear, forceful, unequivocal terms as that. In fact, the strict language that we see in the, the key UN treaty, the UN Convention Against Torture, which goes a little bit further than what I've just recited and, and makes it clear that no exceptional circumstances whatsoever, it's a great word, whatsoever, can serve as a justification for torture. And you only see that in one other UN Human Rights Treaty, and that's the Convention dealing with enforced disappearances. Well, big deal, whatsoever may be an impressive word that I like to say with some pause, <laughs> but of course the very painful, and that's the right word to use given that we're talking about torture, and contrary truth, is that just as strong and absolute and certain the prohibition on torture is, equally so is the size of the gap between that promise and what the reality of torture is around the world. And let me start by reminding us of the human side of this, because much of my talk is going to get lost into provisions of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act and interpretations of UN treaties and rulings from the Supreme Court of Canada, but this is about people, it's about human stories, and of course, given that it's torture, it's about human pain. In September, I was part of an Amnesty International delegation that went into a maximum security prison in the Mexican state of Nayarit. Uh, and uh, 
I, in all of my years of human rights work, have never been through so many levels of intrusive and extensive security uh, as what I went through to get inside this prison. And just as a little footnote, that's saying a fair bit given that amongst the many locales I've visited over the years, three times in Guantanamo Bay. But it took us well over a year, uh, oh, a year, it felt like a year, an hour uh, to get through all of the checks and body pat downs and scans and creative use of ultraviolet uh, light and on and on. You would imagine, therefore, that we were on our way in to visit some notorious kingpin in one of the Mexican drug cartels, but we weren't. We were there to visit a prisoner of conscience and a survivor of torture. A man named Amilcar Angel Quevedo uh, Colon. And Angel had been imprisoned. He wasn't Mexican, actually. He was Honduran. He was a Honduran migrant from Honduras' Africo African Caribbean Garafuna community. And he had been trying to reach the United States because he wanted to be able to earn more money so that he could afford better cancer treatments to save the life of his seven year old son. But he was caught up in a raid in Tijuana. He was taken into custody and his nightmare began. He was brutalized and demeaned at the hands of his captors and guards. And I can assure you that wonderful absolute ban on torture meant nothing to him. Angel was a human rights activist in Honduras. He was studying to be a priest in Honduras. He wanted to save his son's life. That's why he was crossing the border. But for racist Mexican police and prison guards, they were unable and unwilling to believe that a black man could be anything other than a criminal. And they set out to force that confession from him. First, it was at the hands of the police. He was beaten repeatedly in the ribs. Uh, he was forced to walk around for hours endlessly on his knees. Uh, he was kicked and punched repeatedly in the stomach. And then it got worse. He was transferred to the military. With the military, they blindfolded him. They held him in a room where he could hear nothing but the screams of others in surrounding rooms, uh, told repeatedly that their fate was what awaited him. When they brought him in, they began by repeatedly, uh, several, several times, putting a plastic bag over his head and taking him to the point of asphyxiation and then back and then back to the point of asphyxiation and back. It's sort of like the dry land version of waterboarding, an absolutely grueling form of torture. He was stripped and forced uh, to lick clean uh, the boots of other prisoners and the guards. He was made to strike a number of humiliating poses and all throughout that endlessly racial insults being hurled at him. And on and on it went for 16 non-stop hours and finally he relented and he signed a statement. You're right, I was part of a criminal gang. But that didn't end anything. He then disappeared into the bowels of Mexico's maximum security prison system. He was never charged, he was never brought to trial and no matter how often and to whom he protested that what he had signed was a product of torture, no one cared. No one listened. Certainly no one tried to give him a remedy of any kind. That went on for six years before he was finally able to get word out through the family of another prisoner uh, who were there for a visit, which made its way to Amnesty International and we were able to mobilize. Well, after that visit, worldwide we campaigned relentless for his release and here's the good news and there is good news in the struggle against torture. He was freed about five weeks after we saw him in prison. And he is now out, he's back in Honduras. The Attorney General saw the light of day and dropped the charges in the case. But his experience still hangs there. And what is particularly important to remember is there is nothing even remotely singular about it. His case is not one of dozens or even hundreds, but it's one of thousands in Mexico alone. In Mexico over the last decade, levels of torture have increased not twofold, not threefold, have increased 600% in the last 10 years. And Mexico is just one country 
amongst very, very many. And what that reflects is, when we think of Angel's story and his experience, is simply this. Torture continues to haunt far too many corners, every corner of our planet. And that what it means is that routinely and brutally and secretively, brazenly, insidiously, cruelly, and I assure you always with absolute and total impunity, men, women, and young people everywhere face that harrowing nightmare of torture every single day. And that's why Amnesty International has launched a new campaign for the fourth time uh, in our 50 plus years now, a campaign to really bring attention to the issue of torture. It's got a simple slogan because the slogan captures what it's all about, stop torture. And we've launched this campaign because we can't not respond to 600% more torture in Mexico, to that huge gap between those beautiful, forceful, clear words in UN treaties and the reality on the ground. Here's one other quick statistic that will give you a sense as to how urgent this is. As we launched the campaign, we announced to the world that just based on our own research, and we never pretend that we have every human rights fact about every violation happening in every country everywhere. But based on our own information, in the last five years, there's been torture in 141 countries. That's about three quarters of the world's states. In 2015, I'm not talking about 1971 or 1956 or even 1984, in 2015. So it's a very necessary campaign. It's a campaign that will push governments to prevent torture uh, because that's ultimately what we need to be doing. We can't continue to just endlessly have to mobilize to respond to every Angel Colón that comes along. We need to prevent it, stop it from happening in the first place. And it is certainly a campaign that is going to firmly reject the notion that torture can ever, for any reason, be excused or justified. And let's just take a moment to explore that piece of it. Torture is never excused. Remember those clear words from the treaty, whatsoever. Never excused because it so fundamentally destroys the very essence of human dignity and integrity on which the entire notion of having human rights in the first place rests. Allowing torture creates divisions, creates more victims. It widens the gaps amongst and between us as a human family. More and more victims, more and more survivors. It maims, it dehumanizes, it traumatizes, and very, very often it kills. Individuals are brutalized and families are terrified directly. Those are those who feel the direct impact of torture, but it's wider than that, of course. Communities are absolutely terrorized into silence. And in the end, really, all torture has done is lay the ground for more human rights violations, but also for deeper insecurity. And that's why every time they've come to it in any treaty, governments, not Amnesty International, I wasn't holding the pen, governments wrote the obligation in that clear, absolutely unequivocal way because they knew that torture, for any reason, is the very antithesis of human rights. No exceptions also, though, because torture doesn't work. Not that I want you to think that that would convince me. If someone suddenly showed me that torture did work, that I'd be on board, absolutely not. But it's an additional piece to take account of here. People will say anything, they will confess to anything, they will finger anyone to bring the agony of torture to an end. That's what Angel Colón was telling us in that Nayarit prison cell. I've heard that repeatedly from the hundreds of torture survivors I've interviewed in Canada, in prisons, in refugee camps right around the world. But also remember this piece, no exceptions also, because torture does not stop, no matter what some others will convince you of, there is no such thing as just a little bit, just a little, little bit of torture. 
Of course, it used to be the famous ticking time bomb case. Now it's the fictitious terrorist mastermind, right? Who we have in custody and know with 100% certainty that he is about to launch a terrorist attack that we know, again, with absolute certainty, is imminent. So it's okay to torture him, to get the information, to stop the attack. Well then, surely it must be okay to torture his presumed accomplice who knows where he's hiding, right? And must be okay to torture the presumed accomplice's spouse who knows where the accomplice is hiding, who can lead us to the mastermind, someone who went to school with her, someone who went to the same mosque as the accomplice, is from the same village as the mastermind, you get it, right? And that, I assure you, I'm not just making that up, that is the reality of torture in every single Amnesty International report for more than 50 years. It does not stay confined, it grows, it extends, it reaches further and further. That's what 600% more torture in Mexico is all about. So during the campaign, Amnesty here in Canada will be putting pressure on the Mexican government and on governments right around the world to rein it in, to enact the safeguards that are needed. But we're also going to have a lot to say, have already had a lot to say, to our own government. Not because, I'm not trying to suggest to you that, you know, today, February the 12th, 2015, Amnesty International said torture is rampant in Canada. No. Although, in a moment, I am going to highlight uh, the shocking levels of solitary confinement in Canadian prisons and what that has to say about torture. But there is, even though we don't have the Angel Colon experience playing out every single day in Canadian prisons, there is much that Canada can and must do, nonetheless, to significantly strengthen this country's contribution to ending torture. And I want to take you through four general areas. The first is detention practices and conditions in Canada. The second is complicity in torture elsewhere. The third is justice and redress for torture. And the last is accountability and oversight to avoid torture. So let's begin by turning attention to the home front. And as I say, torture obviously in Canadian jails is not widespread and systematic, but there is one area where we absolutely do have to use the words prisons, Canada, and torture uh, in the same breath. And that is the high use in Canada of solitary confinement, which of course we call something else. We call it administrative segregation, maybe with some hope that if you call it something different, it becomes something different, but it doesn't. It is solitary confinement. And it's worth noting that solitary confinement is an issue that has been receiving increasing amounts of attention within the international human rights system at UN level. And that's very notable. There was a breakthrough moment in 2011 when the world's, when the UN's preeminent expert on torture, the special rapporteur on torture, uh, issued a new report all about this very topic, solitary confinement as torture. And it was the first time that anyone at that level with that sense of authority and expertise had put the issue out in front of governments framed that way. And I want to, actually there's two or three times along the way here where I'm going to kind of do a vocabulary check with you. And this is the first little asterisk here. And it's about the words solitary confinement. Because um, I think we really have to stop here for a moment. I, I know that far too often, even within human rights discourse and human rights activists in the community, we can be a little bit dismissive almost of that. Ah, oh, you know, okay, it's too bad. You must get kind of lonely being held like that. But don't fully take ourselves to really understanding what is at stake here. And I just want to share one sentence from the Special Rapporteur's report that I think quite powerfully underscores why we do need to think of this in the same breath absolutely as other vicious forms of torture. He begins by defining solitary confinement as the physical and social isolation of individuals who are confined to their cells for 22 to 24 hours a day. That, my friends, is administrative segregation in Canada. We're in the ballpark. And then here's how he highlights what's at stake. 
Being confined in isolation for that duration produces severe and sometimes irreversible physical and psychological effects. Anxiety, depression, anger, intolerance of social interaction, cognitive and perceptual distortions, paranoia, psychosis, self-mutilation, and suicide. That's a lot more than loneliness. And he concluded, therefore, that in many circumstances, no matter what, solitary confinement is torture. And in particular, he's talking about when it's used against the young when it's used against people with mental health problems. But he goes on to say that it is so severe and serious and, as he noted, so very, very often irreversible uh, that there absolutely need to be limits. And that in his view, whenever it extends beyond 15 days at a time, it is ipso facto torture or ill treatment and must be prohibited. Well, let's think about Canada for a moment. The practice of solitary confinement in, has become, I think it's safe to say, widespread in Canada, far beyond, as you'll see in a moment, the UN's limits. The Office of the Correctional Investigator, the independent uh, expert uh, given the authority to oversee federal, pris uh, federal prisons, those run by Corrections Canada, notes the following. The law requires that segregation be used as a last resort. That's good and for the shortest period possible. That's good. However, you knew there was going to be a however, didn't you? It has become a standard tool. Standard tool, last resort. Uh, standard tool of population management simply to maintain the safety and security of the institution. On any given day, about 850 of the 14,700 offenders in federal institutions a little math footnote, that's more than 5%, are in segregation units. And the proportion in provincial institutions where it's very difficult to get clear numbers is almost certainly much higher. Well, 5% doesn't exactly sound like last resort. But of even greater concern is what he goes on to observe with respect to the length of solitary confinement. Remember that 15-day cap from the UN? Well, the average in Canada, the average is 40 days. That suggests that there's probably very few that are even down at 15 days. And beyond that, over 10% of individuals in administrative segregation, solitary confinement in Canada, in the federal system, at any one time have been there for more than four months. And the tragic human cost, of course, of all of this mounts Ashley Smith, who's, and it depends on where you stand in this debate, how you describe what happened to her in custody. Who's suicide in custody? Who's death in custody? Who's murder in custody? Was the subject of a coroner's inquest, of course. More recently, Edward Snowshoe's case. Uh, some of you may have seen the, the incredibly extensive and heart-wrenching reporting in the Globe and Mail recently. Uh, about his suicide, uh, absolutely, as a result of this abusive use of solitary confinement. So this has captured international attention. The UN Committee Against Torture, uh, in its 2012 review of Canada's record of compliance with the UN Convention Against Torture, was very clear, this has to stop. This must be reined in. Canada needs limits. The government noted the committee's advice and declined to do anything. More recently, uh, after a year of deliberation, the government similarly rejected the Ashley Smith coroner's inquest recommendations that solitary confinement needed to be dramatically reined in. So now, as many of you likely know, it's off to the courts. Two important lawsuits have just been launched out in BC, the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association along with the John Howard Society here in Ontario, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association with the Elizabeth Fry Society. Um, and it's really come down to that. It's become clear that there's no will, interest uh, within government to do the right thing politically. Uh, so it's now to the courts to tackle what I would say in terms of a domestic side of this whole debate really is Canada's torture disgrace. And I want to turn to complicity. Uh, and here's my second vocabulary check, that word complicity. 
I think, again, that's one of those words we hear it and we all kind of go, oh, phew. He's not saying we do the torture, it's somebody else who does the torture and we're kind of somehow drawn into it, it's not so bad, I don't, I don't need to feel too guilty about this. Just do a little bit of reality check here about what it means when we're talking about complicity in the context of torture. Let's think first about the torturer. And I can assure you from all of our investigating and reporting and researching on torture anywhere, torturers are only able to do and get away with what they do because they have support, backup, encouragement, facilitation from a whole host of others. It's never just about one person. There is complicity everywhere. And the same thing when you bring it up to the level of governments. Governments are only able to carry it out and get away with it because they are supported and protected by other governments. So why do we need to be concerned about complicity? Because without complicity, torture would not happen. This is one of the keys to preventing torture. Well, sadly, Canada has been, continues to be, and has numerous laws and policies that open up the possibility of all sorts more complicity in torture, going back decades, in fact. And we really do need to finally address and resolve this. Start with this one. It is an absolute disgrace. Totally unacceptable that more than six years now since, and take a note of this, a judicial inquiry headed by a former Supreme Court of Canada justice, Frank Iacobucci, this isn't just an Amnesty International report, a former Supreme Court of Canada justice who catalogued a long list of ways that both action and inaction on the part of Canadian officials contributed to the overseas torture and other human rights violations, but we're focused on torture here, of three Canadian citizens, Abdullah Al-Malki, Ahmed Abu El-Mati, and Muyad Nuruddin. That happened to them over a decade ago, the report was issued over six years ago, and today, for several years now, those men have been lost, trapped, in protracted and, and even worse, demeaning and degrading litigation, simply to try to get a word of apology and an appropriate level of redress. Well, I'd suggest to you that it's never acceptable, and in fact is a violation of international human rights, to ever stand in the way of survivors of torture obtaining justice and redress, but it is beyond the pale when we do so with respect to torture that we made possible. And that's what's at stake here. Those concerns about Canadian complicity also include the disturbing revelations over the last few years of what have become known as the ministerial directions issued by a number of different ministers directed to such agencies as CSIS, the RCMP, the Canadian Border Services Agency, uh, CSEC, uh, the Armed Forces. And this is all about how do we handle intelligence when there may be issues of torture that arise. It happens in two directions. And you'd probably like to think, and I'm sure we'd all hope, that the directions say, don't do it. Make sure there's nothing about how we handle intelligence that's going to have anything to do with torture. Wrong. These ministerial directions give the green light, and they give the green light in both directions. So intelligence that comes into the country that may have been obtained through torture somewhere else, we can use it but also intelligence that we're sending out of the country there, even when there's very good reason to believe that it's almost certainly gonna to cause torture elsewhere, go ahead and do it. Now the, the directions do say, but only do this in extraordinary circumstances, but let's go back to those opening words. There's no such thing as extraordinary circumstances when it comes to torture. This also is so troubling because it's as if Frank Iacobucci's inquiry, but also the inquiry headed up by former Ontario Court of Appeal Justice Dennis O'Connor in the case of Meher Arar. It's as if those inquiries never happened. Justice O'Connor, in fact, couldn't have been clearer on this issue. 
And again, often the sentences, the recommendations, the law in this area is very short. Let me read you recommendation 14 from Justice Dennis O'Connor's Arar Inquiry Report. Information should never be provided to a foreign country where there is a credible risk that it will cause or contribute to the use of torture. Well, the ministerial directions, which come along after the inquiry, not before, of course, go in the exact opposite direction, authorizing what should be unconditionally forbidden. Again, the UN's taken notice. The UN Committee Against Torture is very concerned about this, and in that same 2012 review, when they were looking at solitary confinement, highlighted this issue and said, do something about it. Amend those directions to bring them into conformity with international law. And in fact, we're so concerned about this, we want to hear back from you within a year. We don't want to just wait for the next review, which will be six or seven years down the road. Government responded, not a year, it was about 18 months, and said, thanks very much, we've looked at your advice, we think we've got the perfect system, we're not changing anything. We then also have what I often think of as Canada's case of institutionalized complicity, and this is the many years saga now of the case of Omar Khadr which is absolutely, it's about many things, but amongst the many things is about complicity in torture. You know the story, picked up at the age of 15 on the battlefield in Afghanistan by US forces, held there at Bagram Air Base, and no one gets an easy ride at Bagram Air Base, and we know from information he has provided uh, that he was badly treated, almost certainly at a level of torture and ill treatment there, and then similarly, on to Guantanamo Bay, where the mistreatment continued. Well, the Supreme Court of Canada, right, okay, so we've got the Supreme Court of Canada again, former Supreme Court of Canada Justice, Supreme Court of Canada speaking out this time, in January 2010 ruled that Canada had been complicit in Omar Khadr's torture at Guantanamo Bay, without actually calling it torture, as of course we don't actually, the Charter of Rights doesn't talk about torture, we talk about cruel or unusual treatment or punishment. But it's the same thing, listen to the court's words. The interrogation of a youth detained without access to counsel to elicit statements about serious criminal charges while knowing that the youth had been subjected to sleep deprivation and while knowing that the fruits of the interrogations would be shared with prosecutors offends the most basic Canadian standards about the treatment of detained youth suspects. That's code for the Supreme Court saying that Omar Khadr was subject to torture when his US captors used sleep deprivation against him and that Canada became complicit in that torture when Canadian officials showed up willing to benefit from what he had been put through. And here's my last vocabulary check here, sleep deprivation. It's another one of those terms. I think people hear it and they again, have a bit of a sigh of relief. Oh, this isn't one of the really ugly things. This isn't about things underneath the fingernails and, and all those awful things uh, they do to your genitals and on and on. This is, yeah, it's like really extreme insomnia or something, right? Absolutely not. Sleep deprivation is one of the most brutal, debilitating and vicious forms of torture. And don't take my word for it. Listen to this excerpt from the memoirs of, I don't usually quote him, Menachem Begin, the Israeli Prime Minister back in the late 70s and early 80s. He was tortured by the KGB in the Soviet Union and in his memoir he said that what finally, of everything they did to him, what finally pushed him to lose his will to resist was when he was deprived of sleep. And this is how he describes it. In the head of the interrogated prisoner, a haze begins to form. His spirit is wearied to death, his legs are unsteady, and he has one sole desire, to sleep. Anyone who has experienced this desire knows that not even hunger and thirst are comparable with it. I came across other prisoners who signed what they were ordered to sign, only to get what the interrogator promised them. And he did not promise them their liberty. He did not promise them food to sate themselves. He promised them, if they signed, uninterrupted sleep. And having signed, there was nothing in the world that could move them to risk again 
such nights and such days. That is what Omar Khadr endured, that is what Canadian officials knew he endured, and those officials, rather than even in polite Canadian terms, complain about it, gently rebuke his jailers for having treated him that way, instead went along with it, ready and willing to make any use of information gleaned from a sleep-deprived youth. The Supreme Court, of course, went on to say that there should be a remedy for all of that. Well, five years later, we're still waiting. Another unresolved uh, issue about complicity in torture uh, for Canada lingers from the past, and that is the question of Canada's approach to battlefield transfers of prisoners. I'm sure many of you recall the issue. It was a rather prominent one, wasn't it, a few years back? when there was great consternation about how the Canadian military was approaching the issue of battlefield detainees in Afghanistan. Prisoners were being handed over to Afghan officials even though there was near certainty that many would then face torture in Afghan jails. At the time, the issue provoked a near constitutional crisis, prorogation of parliament, a vote of contempt in the House, remember that? against the government, at least one, if not more, minister uh, resigned. But for our purposes today, let's not forget, let's put all that raucous politics aside for a moment. At its heart, the issue was all about complicity and torture, and that has never been resolved. We and the BC Civil Liberties Association had taken the government to court to end the transfers and put something else in place, something else that would comply with international law, not violate it. The government fought vigorously, to say the least, and we had a number of early wins on preliminary motions, and it became clear that judges were concerned about the facts, about the evidentiary record, about the torture that was happening. But it all fell apart on a legal question, that thorny issue of jurisdiction. The Canadian courts ruled that the charter, which was the legal basis to our case. Those of you who have studied international human rights law will know you don't get to walk into a Canadian court waving the UN Convention Against Torture. You have to walk into a Canadian court waving a Canadian statute or the Charter of Rights and then say, I'm here to talk about the Charter and boy do I want to tell you about how all these UN treaties have a bearing on how you need to understand and apply the Charter. But the courts ruled, federal court ruled, federal court of appeal upheld it, and to everyone's astonishment, the Supreme Court refused to hear a further appeal that the charter actually doesn't leave the country with our soldiers. The charter has a lot to say to Canadian soldiers while they're in Canada. It has nothing to say to Canadian soldiers once they leave the country. And for the current time, that's where it stands. It's an issue that's almost certainly gonna arise again, northern Iraq, with a question mark, and we're absolutely going to have to find a way to address it. The answer to concerns that our troops may become complicit in torture happening in other countries can't come down to something along the lines of that may be so, but don't worry too much, the charter doesn't apply. One last area of complicity I, I want to flag uh, is with respect to deportation. It's important to underscore that just as international law is crystal clear when it comes to the prohibition on torture itself, so too the prohibition <coughs> on deporting, extraditing, surrendering, transferring someone across borders uh, to a risk of torture in another country. Those of you who studied refugee law will know that this is the protection against refoulement to torture, and it too is unequivocal, but not so in Canadian law. The Immigration and Refugee Protection Act leaves open the possibility that a deportation can go ahead even in the face of a clear risk of torture. And that's if the government puts a serious issue of criminality or security on the table. It's been challenged and sadly upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in its 2002 Suresh ruling, a case that will always be a sad hostage to timing, a case that was argued before September the 11th, judgment rendered after September the 11th. One wonders if judgment had come down on September the 10th, if we would have some different law in this area. The court did rule that normally 
we do need to be sure that no one is ever sent back to face a risk of torture, but that there may be undefined exceptional circumstances which would justify it. And I can tell you, in the 13 years since, government has frequently asserted and argued those exceptional circumstances, and there are many deportations that have gone ahead. It's often difficult to chart what happens next, but we do know with certainty of cases in at least India and Sri Lanka where torture has happened after a deportation in that context. It's an issue that one imagines is going to end up back in front of the Supreme Court of Canada. There are some cases coming up which will likely put it back in front of the justices. At a minimum, to give some clearer direction as to what constitutes those exceptional circumstances that aren't allowed in international law. And even better, maybe we can hope a chance to revisit the very notion of exceptional circumstances in the first place. Let me move, uh, and I'm going to be quicker here, uh, to the last two areas that I wanted to address with you. And the first is about accountability. It's about justice. It's about redress. And here, too, international law is very strong. It's a bit of a common theme I keep coming back to, isn't it? International law is strong, but uh, look at Canadian law, look at Canadian practice. Well, here, uh, when it comes to criminal responsibility, um, torture is recognized to be an international crime subject to universal jurisdiction and what that means and we have it it's it's been in the canadian criminal code not just for a couple of years but in fact since the late 80s when we ratified the convention against torture and it means that a suspected torturer present in canada must be brought to justice that can be through extradition to face a fair trial somewhere else or through prosecution in our own courts and that's an obligation even if the torturer is not canadian his or her let's say his, victims aren't Canadian, uh, and it didn't happen in Canada. That's what universal jurisdiction is all about. So the law is good here, but Canadian practice over the last 30 years has been far from that. Overwhelmingly, instead, we turn in case after case after case to immigration remedies, to deportation. Concerns about torture, let's just exclude them and get them out of here. Even if that means that they themselves become a victim of torture or even killed or who knows what back in their home country. That's a good end of the story. Or even if, as is more likely to be the case, nothing happens. They walk away scot-free, maybe even return to a bit of a hero's welcome. Where's the justice in that? And certainly there's no conformity with our international obligations. It's not just about criminal law, however. Torture survivors or the families of those who have succumbed to torture have a right to redress for what they've endured. And there have been many attempts by individuals to turn to the Canadian courts to obtain that redress for torture that has happened in other parts of the world. Attempts by Canadian citizens. All have failed, all of them, every single last one, because of a piece of Canadian legislation, our State Immunity Act, which shields foreign governments from civil lawsuits in Canada for harms that happened outside of Canada. You can certainly sue if a foreign official tortured you in Canada, but no civil lawsuits for harms outside of Canada. One exception, it's a big exception, commercial matters. So you can sue for breach of contract that happened in Tehran. You cannot sue for torture that happened in Tehran. And most unfortunately, last fall, that was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in the case of Zara Kazemi, uh, a suit that was brought by the son of an Iranian-Canadian photojournalist, a remarkably courageous woman who had been taking uh, photos uh, not far from uh, Tehran's notorious Evin prison, and then ended up imprisoned there and was tortured, was raped, and died in Evin. Well, the court concluded that that lawsuit couldn't go ahead, that the State <coughs> Immunity Act trumped all other arguments, including those that interveners like Amnesty International had made about the use cogent nature of torture, about all the provisions in the Convention Against Torture, including those that obligate states to ensure that there are remedies. Instead, the justices, uh, and it wasn't all of them, there was one dissent, but it was a 6-1 ruling, and they weren't necessarily comfortable 
with their ruling, but they said it was absolutely clear. The State Immunity Act's language was unambiguous, so there was no ability or need to turn to any of the other eloquent arguments that had been put in front of the court. The State Immunity Act says no such lawsuits and that it's up to Parliament to change that. Obviously, that's where we now need to turn our attention. The last area where Canada needs to considerably up its game when it comes to doing so, uh, to doing our part uh, to end torture, is the whole area of oversight and review. And this, as you'll see in a moment, is a rather timely and topical area of concern. This is important because we know, we absolutely know, that one of the most important ways to confront torture is to ensure that oversight, review, bodies that scrutinize, processes that investigate and examine exist so that they can pierce the silence, the secrecy that in many respects, maybe, maybe only impunity is the torturer's greater friend than secrecy and silence is. And we know it. We've seen it all the time in our work. One of the reasons that torture continues at such alarming rates is because it happens so far, far away from any watchful eyes. And we need to get those watchful eyes closer and closer to where it happens. Well, we do have quite a bit of prison oversight in Canada. I referred earlier, of course, to the work of the uh, Correctional Investigators Office. That's with respect to federal prisons. Provincial level, it gets a lot more uncertain and uneven. And there are some detention centers that have no scrutiny. Immigration detention at the hands of Canadian Border Services Agency, for instance, nothing. But what I want to highlight in particular here is that whole area of complicity in torture that happens elsewhere, especially in national security cases. And back in 2006, when Justice Dennis O'Connor was carrying out the Meher Arar inquiry, he was actually given a very specific mandate to look at that. The government knew that that was of sufficient concern that not only should Justice Dennis O'Connor get the facts right as to what happened to Meher Arar and figure out how to avoid that in the future, but to look at this issue of review and oversight. Why did we not have a system that caught this, that made sure it didn't happen, that addressed it while it was unfolding? He came forward with a very thoughtful, detailed, comprehensive proposal that that moves us forward on two fronts. Number one, he was very, very focused on the fact that, and this is back in 2006, imagine in 2015, but he was highlighting in 2006 how national security work has become like this. All the agencies and departments and law enforcement and government bureaucrats, etc., work in these often almost seamless integrated teams that brings together CSIS with foreign affairs officials and the Ontario Provincial Police and the RCMP. Yet we still have these systems of siloed review that only get to look at, okay, my job is to look at that one player and I look at this one player. So it's a perfect recipe for all sorts of things falling between the cracks, isn't it? But even worse, as he highlighted, the powers all of those various agencies have couldn't be more different. Some are half decent, some are laughable, some, like CBSA, non-existent. So he proposed a model that would, number one, strengthen the powers to make sure that all of the review bodies have the ability and the powers to do their work, and then a mechanism that would draw it together, that if you're going to have integrated national security work, you need integrated national security review and oversight. Well, that's eight years old now. I don't know how thick the dust on that report would be by now. Eight years of dust, I think, needs more than just a good dose of pledge. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is a report that has been ignored by the government. <coughs> but what a time to dust it off. Here we are in the midst of the most significant round of national security reform that we've been through since 2001 that is giving unbelievably enhanced and very troubling and unclear and potential to be abused powers to CSIS, unprecedented powers to CSIS, that's creating new criminal offenses, promotion of terrorism in general. <laughs> so we've got all of that happening, maybe, alongside something decent happening on the review and oversight front. Well, the only additional oversight piece is that CSIS, in carrying out these new acts of disruption that they're allowed to do now, 
If any of those acts actually violate the charter, they have to go and get authorization from a judge. That's where we've gone with review and oversight. That review and oversight is you get a judge to authorize charter violations. Beyond that, absolutely nothing. So friends, we really, really need to focus. There's a lot we need to focus on in terms of the substance of those bills. We absolutely need to maintain firm, firm pressure for finally Canada's national security review and oversight gap to be addressed. The last review and oversight piece I want to leave with you uh, is one of the priority issues in our current Stop Torture campaign, and that is that we're going to be highlighting how vital and how absolutely long overdue it is that Canada sign on to a very important torture prevention treaty known as, it's got a long name, the Optional Protocol to the UN Convention Against Torture and Other Forms of Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Treatment and Punishment. We'll call it the Optional Protocol. And it's an important treaty that's all about review and oversight. This is a treaty, you know, it's kind of unique in the world of UN treaties. UN treaties, and I'm almost going to sound derisive, which Amnesty International <laughs> clearly isn't about UN treaties, but most UN treaties are sort of fine words and promises and governments shall do this and governments shall not do that. The optional protocol is actually, and here's what you have to do about it. Here's a whole system of national level and international level inspections, almost like spot audits of detention centers, which is all about getting experts into prisons to find the conditions that breed, allow, and encourage torture and stamp it out. It's practical, it's concrete, it's something that can make a difference. It was agreed to by the UN in 2002. Canada's had almost 13 years, well, 12 and a half years now to get on board. Uh, 76 other countries have done so, and it southern neighbors excluded, it, it includes pretty well all of our closest like-minded allies. It's an impressive number, but it's not a hugely impressive number. The Convention Against Torture itself, the one that's full of all the wonderful promises and principles and definitions, has 155 countries on board. And the difference here is, I think, this one really hurts. You sign on to this one, and you don't just get to disregard the promises you've made, you sign on to this one and you're opening yourself up to scrutiny. So we absolutely need to be pushing countries to get on board here. Canada should be leading the charge there. And because there will be such disinterest, suspicion, reluctance to do so, this is an area where we need as much diplomatic muscle as possible, as many champions as we can possibly muster. But 12 and a half years later, Canada's not on that list. Signing on would be helpful on the domestic front. I keep saying we do have some review and oversight and I'm a great fan of the work of the Office of the Correctional Investigator, but we do have lots of gaps. And increased scrutiny would even be of benefit for us domestically. But my heavens, we want to be doing everything we can to be pushing for an end to torture in Iran, in Syria, in China, in countries where not only is torture rampant, but there is not a single body, law, agency, commission, investigator, nothing that has the job of looking for it, preventing it, and redressing it. So please, please uh, join us in taking that up. 12 plus years of standing on the sidelines around something that should have been a no-brainer. We should have been down at the UN on day two after that optional protocol was adopted. We've said to the UN twice that we were probably going to do so. In 2006, when we ran for election to the new UN Human Rights Council, uh, under a new election process where you were supposed to make promises uh, when you wanted to be elected. You were supposed to make promises to the rest of the international community. Well, that's the promise we made. Vote for us and we will consider ratifying the optional protocol. We won, we won handily. In fact, we got a full maximum three-year term. We served the term. We certainly didn't ratify, and I would argue we didn't even consider ratifying. We came back to it again in 2009. Our first review in the brand new UN Human Rights Council's Universal periodic review process, first time ever in the UN system that there's a process that makes sure every single country from Andorra to China has its human rights record reviewed. 
It was a big recommendation coming out of that review. And in response, we said, yeah, okay, you're right. And you know what? We're going to consider ratifying the optional protocol. 2013 comes along. This universal periodic review happens once every four and a half years. So we have our second go round. And a lot of countries are saying back to Canada, well, last time you said, consider ratifying. Doesn't look to us like you've done either. Can you update us? And it emerged right alongside the concerns about violence against Indigenous women in Canada, emerged as the most frequently repeated recommendation to Canada at the end of that review. And you know what we did this time? We haven't even stuck with that mushy, weaselly language of consider ratifying. We just said back to the world community, Canada has no intention to ratify at this time. So we figure it's time finally for the government to hear from Canadians on this, because it hasn't big. I mean, I'm sure none of you can, probably a lot of you are hearing about this treaty for the first time. None of you can uh, remember reading a news article about it or having had an opportunity to sign a petition on it. And over the coming year, we're going to be doing everything we can. Uh, we want this to be one of those treaties that, uh, one of those petitions that takes off into the stratosphere, not 6,423 signatures, not 32,175 signatures. We want it to be in the six figures. We want leaders and political figures and Canadians of influence to be speaking out. We want ethno-cultural communities across Canada to be speaking out and saying, you know what, we want torture to end in Iran. We want Canada to be leading that. Please ratify this so that you can do more to end torture in Iran. Please check out our website, amnesty.ca slash stop torture. Uh, you'll certainly find this petition there and you'll find many other actions. It's an important campaign. It's a very troubling issue. I know it's a heavy issue and I've left with you a lot of areas where there's a lot to be done. But do remember, we do prevail. Angel Colon was released from prison. His torture ended and that was all about mobilizing and speaking out and people being concerned. And that, at the end of the day, is what will make a difference here. And I know it. I absolutely know it. I, clearly, torture must be stopped, uh, but I'm absolutely certain that torture can be stopped as well. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Why don't you stay uh, mm -hmm. up at the podium? We're going to take questions. Um, you've, you've left us with a lot to consider. You took us to the edge of despair, uh, and then I hope uh, redeemed our hope in, in uh, international human rights, perhaps in uh, pol domestic politics, if not in the law or in the formal institutions. Uh, you've, you've opened up channels for thinking about ways that, that we can take action. Uh, both within the legal framework and outside the legal framework, which is uh, a, a really interesting and, and important way to be thinking. Um, on a daily basis, we struggle here as someone who teaches international human rights, how to retain that hope in the potential of, of international human rights and how to see the role of the lawyer as being one that can be constructive rather than one of, of banging one's head against the, the wall constantly. Um, you left the law for uh, a sort of political activism in which your 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 strength in the law uh, remains an important feature of your of your job. Um, I wonder if I could maybe invite you to to reflect a little bit on your transition from lawyer representing individual clients to sort of legal activist, political activist, and social mobilizer slash uh, organizer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I'll, I'll steal my sure. question first and then I'll, and then I'll take <laughs> okay. questions from the audience. No, I think it's a very good question. And what I would say is it hasn't been about leaving one realm to move into another. I think it's, uh, I, I, I think of it all as part and parcel of, of the same struggle. Uh, and that uh, even being in, in obviously a context now which is, which is overwhelmingly about advocacy and outreach and awareness building, uh, working with the law, including very conventional ways, going to court, uh, is, is an absolutely essential part of how we do our work. Uh, at any given time, uh, we probably have at least a half a dozen legal files uh, that are active. Usually, uh, interventions that we're pursuing, mainly at the level of the Supreme Court of Canada, but at other, ish, uh, at other levels as well. Sometimes, even as, as I said with the Afghan prisoner case, as the ones who launch uh, the lawsuit, when we think it's 
exceptional and necessary to do. So what for me is so powerful to be doing this kind of work from where I stand now is that it's, it's a, a place where I see how we can bring it all together, uh, where what we're doing in court is backed up uh, by how we're trying to mobilize people around awareness building or how we're trying to encourage uh, people to do action or the kinds of solidarity we're offering uh, and standing with uh, victims and survivors and their families is, is recognizing the need for uh, to, to really address this all as a holistic strategy that that working on human rights issues only in court is always going to be unsatisfying um, and far too often not turning to the courts as part of our human rights work especially at times when the political context gets a bit difficult, and let's face it, I think that's what we face these days in Canada. Uh, not opening yourselves up to, to looking at possible ways to address it through the courts is also going to be very limiting. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and I think, I'm sure all of you can think of all sorts of ways in which you've seen that those kinds of powerful relationships and partnerships of, of work on issues almost kind of flowing seamlessly uh, from the streets into the courts and and out onto Facebook and uh, you know out into research and advocacy and back into a court appeal etc and I think that's absolutely the best kind of strategy. It's worth mentioning you have an Osgood grad currently articling in your office in Ottawa. I do. We have uh, we've been very lucky through um, through a wonderful program. Those of you who don't know it, that the Law Foundation funds actually known as. It sounds rather hoity-toity, public interest articling fellowships. Um, but at its heart, what it is is the Law Foundation recognizing that there's all sorts of public interest settings, working with NGOs uh, in the main, where, uh, where there's great potential to get involved in phenomenal legal work, but where the organizations have no budget at all uh, to think about bringing on articling students. Um, so, uh, so they fund, I think, about five or six a year with various organizations. We've been lucky enough to have uh, a fellow with us for, I think, about nine years now. Uh, and, and this isn't about boasting about Amnesty International, it's just the reality of our work. Boy, do they get involved in, you know, so like day one and first thing on your desk is, okay, we need a factum that's going into the Supreme Court of Canada a week from Wednesday, give me a first draft. Uh, oh, and by the way, here's this long list of 20 of Canada's most accomplished human rights lawyers who all do pro bono work for us. They're going to be your stable of legal associates for the coming year. It's really, really dynamic and exciting opportunities. And yes, uh, this year we have an incredibly accomplished, very bright young woman, uh, an Osgood grant. Great. Um, any questions? And maybe we'll yes. just... I'll try to keep track of, of who's, who's up and just okay. pass the mic around. Um, and, and, and just to point out, we are recording this. Your, your voices are not going to be amplified, but they're going into the recording device and will be up on the internet uh, for all to see and hear. And that's part of uh, the mandate of Nathanson Center, just so everybody knows okay. the questions will be recorded. Well, I hope I can structure my question okay then. <laughs> yeah, um, now it's suddenly just going to have stage fright. Yeah, pressure. Um, <laughs> first of all, thank you for a really engaging and uh, interesting, although not particularly uplifting, discussion. <laughs> um, I was sort of tying together a few things that you were talking about with regard to complicity and also with regard to the ministerial directions to administrative bodies. Um, it struck me, I was doing some research for an, an NGO last summer and uh, I was asked to look into improperly obtained evidence and what, and what you could do to try and convince a board or tribunal to not accept it. And there's basically no real laws around evidence when it comes to administrative bodies. So even if those ministerial directions hadn't come down, um, it seems to me that the way an administrative law is currently structured, uh, or bodies are basically motivated to accept evidence no matter how it was obtained, insofar as it's credible. Um, and that's been even upheld in judicial review, so even with additional judicial review, I'm thinking of, uh, there was a case with the Parole Board of Canada, I think, in a section, it was a evidence obtained through an illegal police search and uh, the court, as I understand it, basically said that it wasn't the parole board's job to uh, judge how the evidence was obtained, only to judge its credibility and to take into account all the information that it had available to it in making its decision. Um, that speaks to a larger, more systemic issue with regard to, well, the fact that Canada doesn't really extend its evidence laws. I mean, we have really quite rigorous ones when it comes to criminal law and then it sort of just slowly scales down to the point with administrative bodies there's basically none. 
And I guess there's two things. One that seems sort of tangentially related to human rights issues, even though it directly impacts it. And also, I don't really know from an activist perspective how you get people excited about, uh, you know, legal reform with regard to the rules of evidence in Canada. <laughs> So, what do we want? Yeah. <laughs> Evidence rules reforms. <laughs> so that's sort of a multi-layered thing, but I, I was hoping I could get your thoughts on that because I, I'm out of, I, I don't have any ideas. I just, and if, I don't even know if I properly characterize right. the issue. Well, it's interesting. I mean, what, uh, what we hear from the government um, with respect to this particular issue about torture that may have been obtained mm -hmm. abroad and then, and then enters the intelligence system is we will hear back from them that, you know, I mean, don't worry, we're not gonna, we're not gonna use it in court. Uh, this, is, this is only that it may be used um, in, for the purposes of intelligence mm -hmm. activities, investigations, etc. Uh, and, uh, and that we know that we can't, if that information was obtained through torture, uh, that we can't rely upon it uh, in court. That may be so. But there are, are all sorts of weaknesses, and I'll, I'll admit I'm actually not on top of where the law stands around administrative tribunals and yeah. uh, this, but even beyond that, there are, are all sorts of ways in which where, where we do have to be concerned about it. One is in the whole area of what are known as the immigration security certificates, which I'm sure many of you know of, a very secretive process used to deal with um, immigrants against whom there are serious national security allegations and the government seeking to, uh, to deport them are denied access to the bulk of the evidence against them, not given an opportunity to cross-examine and probe that evidence. Uh, there is an individual known as a special advocate who is supposed to be playing that role to a certain degree, but they're not allowed, unless they have exceptional authorization from a judge, uh, to speak with the individual concerned once they've seen all of this secret evidence. And amidst all of that, there of course has always been concern that there's almost certainly, and we with revelations over time now know that it is the case, that there is information in those files that has almost certainly, certainty, um, you know, you're, you're rarely there with 100%. You know, the intelligence doesn't arrive from Syria with a, with a stamp on it saying, you know, obtained through torture, you know, 100% guaranteed. Um, but, you know, you can almost always be 95, 96% certain. Uh, interestingly, when we went through the last round of law reform around immigration security certificates, which was in response to the Supreme Court's 2007 ruling striking down, the security certificate process. This issue kept coming up uh, and the government said, the government kept trying to be very dismissive of it. You know, why, you don't need to be concerned about that. We know what law is with respect to evidence that you can't rely on evidence obtained through torture. But they did, it was the one tiny little concession we got. They did agree that in the end, it could, should, and would be helpful to actually clarify that in the law. And so there was a provision added um, as part of those security certificate provisions, making it absolutely clear that the secret evidence can't include information obtained through torture. The bigger problem, though, about the secrecy of the system and the fact that you, you don't have the, the reliability of the full-on adversarial legal process, which is the best way to surface concerns uh, that something has been obtained through torture, that still stands there, right? Special advocates do what they can, uh, but when they're not able to go back to the individual concerned and check things out, get advice, explore other possible lines of questioning, etc., uh, they're pretty hampered. So, uh, so I think you're right, to, even though I, I can't respond in particular to the administrative tribunal's level, um, I think you're right to be concerned that even though the law here, I mean, there are mm -hmm. rules of evidence around information obtained, they don't say information obtained through torture, they say information obtained through duress, etc. cetera, uh, should be pretty clear, uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of areas where it ain't so clear and, and where we do, I think, need some stronger guidance from courts and, and possibly some further law reform. You described secrecy as impunity's kid brother in <laughs> yes. enabling torture. Well, that's, um, yeah, yeah, that's a good, I, I may use that. Uh. <laughs> feel free. Um, <coughs> the, the Harkat, recent, the most recent Harkat decision uh, 
adds further uh, juice to your cocktail of despair uh, in pretty much preserving uh, a system mm -hmm. in which confidential secret sources are, are protected, despite the fact the government recognized that oftentimes those sources are unsavory characters that, mm -hmm. that, that might not otherwise be trusted. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, you know, we, um, we've had some great rulings on the human rights front uh, from the Supreme Court uh, over a number of years now. But at best, on the national security front, it's been uneven. I mean, I've already talked about Suresh back from 2002. I think Harkat, uh, a very good uh, example as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, Omar Khadr, they were very strong. Their first round around the security certificates, very strong. So it's a mixed record, I guess. But it does, it does certainly continue to be an area where you can see that the court uh, is nervous, is cautious, is, is conservative. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, one more reason, I think, why we have to be so engaged and as vociferous as we can right now around the law reform process that we're faced with. Uh, because we actually do, abs you know, sometimes you kind of go, oh, well, we didn't get the reforms we needed, but it's all right. The judges will take care of it. <laughs> And I, we can never be that confident when it comes to national security issues. Um, there's lots there that would be ripe uh, for judicial challenge. Uh, in my view, there's lots there that blatantly is in contravention of the Charter. Uh, but I don't have absolute confidence that we wouldn't end up with another Harkat ruling. Amongst the many things that was disappointing, deeply disappointing to Amnesty, uh, because we put a lot of work, we had a great legal team, our wonderful articling student uh, played a central role, um, and, uh, and we put all sorts of important international legal arguments uh, in front of the court. I'm sure you all know every single word of the Harkat ruling. There's not one reference to a single international legal principle. There's no quote. Uh, no citation to a UN treaty, nothing. No UN bodies, no UN experts. It's as, if, it's as if this has absolutely no international context at all, which was really troubling. Michael Blossom made great uh, mm -hmm. arguments yes. on your behalf there. Uh, more questions, comments, observations? Uh, Alex, I had one question for you. How do you deal with, at Amnesty, the public perception that torture is somehow, I mean, that you get from all the cop shows, from all the Hollywood movies, that in the end it does work. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? I mean, what, it, I mean, yeah. there must be some way that that can be fought in a very concerted, clear way. I mean, I, I think that recent report from the US about the fact that in fact they didn't get any valuable information um, through the torture was was helpful but it you know it played in the press for one day yeah no it, yeah it's really tough and, and just a word about that one day uh in a moment but um you're you're absolutely right the whole pop culture context of this is hugely problematic um and we have tried including as part of our current campaign to sort of prioritize some strategies as to how we confront that uh part of it of course being not so much from a campaigning perspective, but trying to forge relationships with filmmakers, producers, et cetera, who have the power to be deciding how these things get portrayed uh, on television and movies, et cetera, and, and uh, have a different kind of conversation about it. Uh, that's tough. Uh, there's obviously the campaigning side of just trying to get out there with a different narrative, a different message, but boy, when you're up against you know, the multi-billion dollar budgets of Hollywood and, uh, and cable TV, that's certainly not so easy either. There are incredibly powerful voices that can and need to be heard on this, and I was absolutely gonna highlight, do we need anyone more than the US Senate itself saying, uh, you know what? All of this torture that's happened post September the 11th is awful and disturbing and illegal, and here it is in all its ugly, insidious detail. Oh, and guess what? It didn't work. We didn't get good intelligence. We didn't stop any terrorism by doing all of these dastardly, nasty things. It's interesting. Um, there's just sort of this, it just sort of hangs there as a quirk of timing. Not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but 
you know, the report goes out, uh, starts to get quite a bit of attention, even up here. We were doing lots of media responding it, there was lots of chatter, and then suddenly, that's the exact moment when the US government decided they were going to go full guns around the, the interview. The, the, they were finally going to respond to uh, you know, the North Korean film, etc. And that, that took over instead, right? And all the media and, and, and the US Senate, you were right, it, it, was, it ended up being a one day wonder because it totally got eclipsed by what ended up being like a 10 day circus around that film. Um, and it is what it is, unfortunately. I think, I think some momentum that was building there that was, that was probably starting to therefore seep into people's consciousness at the kind of level it, we need it to, if we're going to be dislodging what pop culture has accomplished, uh, was eclipsed. Some of the most powerful voices on this kind of torture doesn't work uh, side of things actually aren't. It's not me, it's not human rights voices, it's actually there's some very, very eloquent law enforcement voices out there and who, who, who go on even beyond simply saying it doesn't work, you know, you, you get bad information uh, which sends you down the wrong line of inquiry. Uh, but we'll talk very eloquently and I've heard this a couple of times from people, uh, I remember years ago hearing a, uh, a retired police officer from New York City who had been uh, on the New York City police force back in the really ugly days when, of course, we didn't talk about it as torture, we talked about it as abuse. <laughs> but abuse and beating suspects, etc., in police stations in New York was, was commonplace everywhere. And one of the things he highlighted about it was what was particularly disturbing is that as that became the culture and the norm, it distracted everyone from doing the good policing, right? Like why would you want to invest hours and hours and hours and hours and hours in finding sources and developing relationships at street level, the kind of stuff that gives you good information when you, know, you look around you and see, well, all your buddies simply do is haul somebody in and beat a confession out of them. Why don't you just do that? And that he could, could really see how it kind of creeps in at that level of culture as well, not just on a case specific basis. Those voices are what need to be heard and given prominence, um, but it is a big challenge. Thank you. Um, right after 2009 and 10 with the Ocean Lady and the MV Sunsea, um, there are reports that uh, Canadian law enforcement were involved in uh, raids in places in Thailand and Malaysia where refugees were housed. Um, and I know the government of Australia has uh, used uh, third countries who are not signatories to the Refugee Convention to kind of intercept uh, boats. Um, in relation to torture, how, um, you know, where, where were we places in terms of the spectrum uh, of, of Canadian involvement that you were talking about earlier? Uh, and what kind of uh, uh, redress can we expect, I guess, in the longer term, and, and what should we be advocating for with respect to uh, basically uh, Canada subcontracting is dirty work? Yeah, well, there's, so, I mean, so there's two issues that I guess arise in that context. One is, um, is sort of the subcontracting scenario, which is which is the whole extraordinary rendition, black holes, that, that whole ugly world that has unfolded since September the 11th, uh, which has been used by many uh, governments, obviously most notoriously by the US government, and that's one of the, the very key, um, well, well-documented findings in the US Senate Committee report. Uh, but not just uh, the US, but this notion that, that somehow we, uh, we just set it up set it up in, in, in all sorts of different ways. You know, the, the US may have been setting it up with a fleet of ghost planes run by the CIA that ferries people around the world in the middle of the night and plunks them down in detention centers to be jailed uh, and tortured. Uh, Canada had a much more Canadian model. We of course didn't have all of those ghost planes to, to mobilize. Instead, it was about how and when we would share information about people when we knew they were crossing an international border. That's what happened uh, in the cases of Arar, Almalki, Almaty, Nuruddin. Um, it was sharing information at a time with a partner in a way that 
would encourage them to be arrested by someone else, and then it all unfolds. Um, the other, and sort of the, your, your concern about what was playing out in Thailand is, is, is m even more troubling or a different kind of troubling than that subcontracting notion, and that's partnership. Uh, it's you know, when we're doing a raid together, uh, when we're doing joint operations. Um, this is a little bit of what sometimes the Afghan prisoner issue was about too. Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes it was we were out there taking the prisoners jointly with Afghan, Afghan counterparts, but then we kind of back away, they take over the detention side of things and, and boom, off they go and torture happens. Um, now, I don't know enough about some of the case specifics as to how things were unfolding during the raids in Thailand. Certainly, Amnesty has frequently over the years spoken out about concerns about the use of torture in Thailand. Um, so the possibilities that Canadian officials were either at a minimum witnessing uh, some abusive, almost certainly ill treatment, but possibly even up to the level of torturous tactics during the raid uh, can't be uh, overlooked. And then there's the whole secondary question of once they're taken off uh, and into detention uh, and we're not there anymore, are we absolved? Do we no longer have any responsibility? Well, of course we do. Uh, Charter of Rights doesn't apply, apparently, um, but, uh, but that can't be the end of, of the, the legal side of things. Um, clearly, it's a, it's a tough road to pursue redress for that within the Thai legal system, uh, but, uh, but I think we do need to be thinking creatively about whether there's other ways through civil lawsuits uh, to, to pursue some sort of redress, looking at the international system to at least be advancing complaints. Um, we need the evidence, we need the clarity around what has happened, but there's, there's lots there to potentially be concerned about. Maybe I'll take one last question if I, if I may, if there's no other hands. Fine, Alex, I just appreciate a comment by you on the present security legislation proposed by the government and the fact that the Liberal Party announced that it would support the legislation uh, when it is passed, which undoubtedly it will be, without scrutiny and provisions for oversight and so forth. Uh, that struck me as rather surprising. The NDP, I think, has taken a different position. I'd just be interested in your commentary as to why and the significance of the Liberal Party position. Right. Um, now, we ourselves are still in the process of develop, it's a 70 plus page bill. Um, so we haven't yet put out there our entire analysis. Uh, but at this stage, I can certainly assure all of you that we have concerns uh, and that there will be a number of provisions in the legislation that we're, that we'll be calling for their either complete repeal uh, or at least very significant amendments. I, f I flagged, for instance, that whole area of these dramatic new powers of disruption uh, given to CSIS and this absurd judicial oversight role of authorizing charter violations. There is ample uh, human rights concern there, obviously. Uh, the new criminal offense around uh, promoting terrorism in general. We don't disagree that there's validity around criminal offenses if we're talking about, um, you know, aiding a terrorist offense, uh, encouraging and inciting a terrorist offense, you know, an act of terrorism. But, uh, but a whole host of problems uh, when we're getting into this realm of promoting it in general. Uh, and many have highlighted the, uh, the difficulty in drawing lines there that don't uh, infringe on freedom of expression. Um, certainly some real cautions about the solidifying now of CSIS's power and ability uh, to be doing overseas uh, work. All the cautionary lessons from the Arar case, the Yakabuchi inquiry, just seem to be uh, ignored there. Um, anyway, and, and a number of other concerns. But yes, you're totally right to, alongside that, flag the issue of review and oversight. My understanding of the Liberal position is that while they have said they're not, um, and one assumes this may be still in evolution, but uh, while they're not going to oppose the substantive provisions, including the ones I've just highlighted, 
that they're actually very strongly going to campaign for the review and oversight uh, provisions to be addressed, and we welcome that. Um, our approach will be to, to highlight both levels, uh, that it's not a matter of saying, okay, here's a really bad law, uh, which has all sorts of very troubling and even sinister human rights consequences, but that's okay as long as we have some review standing above it. That's, I mean, that's not a human rights argument, obviously. Uh, from a human rights perspective, we want both. We want the law to be framed in ways that are going to avoid the possibilities, or minimize, I guess I should say, the possibilities for human rights violations and for there to be review and oversight, which will pick up the inev inevitable cases which even with a better drafted law uh, will still come up on the human rights front. I think that's what we need to be pushing for. Um, with respect to that question, uh, on the specific issue of torture, do you think that there's something to be said for the um, concern that by enabling CSIS to now engage in law enforcement, you create a sort of arms race between CSIS and the RCMP uh, that increases the likelihood of violations and the fact that, that accountability and oversight hasn't been increased, ratcheted up to match the new levels of power, are we creating a situation in which torture uh, forms of torture that might never have been uh, uh, committed in Canada could be seen to commit or where the s types of patterns you've described are more likely to increase and be undiscovered? Uh, there's a whole hornet's nest uh, of stuff around what this bill does or does not mean around the relationship between CSIS and the RCMP. Um, and, uh, um, and, and there's been many commentators who have been, uh, who have been highlighting that, in, including from this perspective of is this putting them, is this creating a better partnership between them or is this creating more potential for, for rivalries and, and a lack of clarity as to who's doing what in what kinds of instances for what reason. Um, uh, one, one person I'm going to be very interested to hear from more about this is Justice uh, John Major, who presided over the Air India inquiry, of course, uh, which was all about, well, was about many, many, many troubling things, but certainly one of the things that that inquiry was all about was revealing the multitudinous forms of dysfunction in the CSIS RCMP uh, relationship. And I know that he's very frustrated. We had him speak at a conference that we organized in Ottawa in October, and his level of frustration and dismay at that point that the government had done absolutely nothing and he did not mince words in, as to what he thought of Minister Vic Taves, who was the responsible minister at the time. He said, either Minister Taves didn't meet, read my report, and these are his words, not mine, or, or Minister Taves is so stupid he didn't understand what I wrote. <laughs> That's his assessment. That's the former Supreme Court of Canada <laughs> justice talking about a former, uh, that's right. Um, but that was then. I can only imagine that his level of despair and frustration uh, will be tenfold now because this, I think, legislation in many respects just goes in completely the opposite direction from the kinds of things that he felt was necessary. Well, with that, let me uh, draw the event to a close. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, and most importantly, thank you, Alex, for delivering such a highly engaging and although concerning, uh, ho we hope, I, I hope, hope-inspiring uh, talk for us to keep us engaged in these issues and uh, with continued interest in your organization's work. Great. Thanks very much for being okay. here. Thank you. Amnesty.ca slash stop torture. Check it out regularly.